Tulsa Bible Church. Happy Sunday. I hope everybody survived Ice Mageddon. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. I'm Sarah Rahm, and I am the Children's Ministry Director. If you are a visitor here with us today, if you would do me a favor, there is a card in the seat back in front of you. If you could fill that out and you can drop it in the box on the way out or take it to the Welcome Center. Um, we have a little gift for you, but you can also get your smartphone out and there's a little thing on the back of the seat with a QR code and you scan it or you take a picture of it and it'll take you to our website with all of these cool high-tech computery things. So you can do that too. Um, all right, two announcements. First of all, February 8th is a Wednesday and we are having a children's church clean out day from one to three. We're going to be focusing on the K4 and K5 rooms, the children's church rooms, because we've got lots of fun things happening. We just got to get it cleaned out and spick and span. So if you want to help me with that, please do. And you can just ask me any questions you have about that whenever you want to. All right. Also coming up on February 12th, it's a Sunday. I think you all know what is happening. It's the NFL championship game. I'm not allowed to say the real word for some reason, but we're going to have a special service and you can wear your team jersey, whatever team you love or however that works, just wear it. And uh, that's going to be a fun thing. But also that night at five o'clock, the youth are going to be hanging out, watching the game. Um, if you want to be a part of that, please bring $4 to help cover the cost of pizza and drinks. Again, that's at five o'clock on February uh, 12th. All right, also coming up is the Reality Conference. This is a great family event um, to just learn how to defend your faith, which is so important right now. That is February 24th through the 25th. If you have any questions about that, please contact Dustin Long and he can answer any questions you have. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. I pray it's a blessing for you and your family. Let's worship the Lord. Good morning. If you guys have your Bibles, I hope you do. Turn to Exodus chapter 1. And we're going to be a brand new sermon series on Exodus for the next several weeks. So I want to encourage you to come on back if you're just joining us for the first time. This is a great time to jump into TBC and uh, just uh, kind of figure out a little bit about us, some of the ministries that we have going on, and, and hopefully you can stick around for a while. Um, after the service at the welcome desk, we do have some gifts for you, so please don't forget to stop by there. As you guys are turning to uh, the book of Exodus, let me pray, and we'll look into God's Word. Father in heaven, again, we just um, thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, come together to worship you, uh, to sing to you, to learn more about you, and the way that you have moved throughout history, Lord. And as we begin this uh, sermon series through Exodus, I pray that the message of redemption would be just central in our hearts, that we would see these passages ultimately fulfilled in Christ and what he's done for us as our Passover lamb, crucified from the foundations of the world. Lord, we, um, we turn our hearts, our affections, our attention to you now and to the truth that you would have for us. We ask that you'd bless this time, and it's in the name of your Son and by your Spirit we pray. Amen. If you ever get a chance to uh, go to the Holy Land, go to Israel. I highly recommend everybody go there at least once if you can do it in your lifetime. Uh, you'll, you will inevitably come to a place that's at the base of the Mount of Olives, just east of the uh, city of Jerusalem. The wall is Jerusalem proper. Go across the valley there to the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane is really a it's a really great place. This is where archaeologists believe that Jesus was praying before his crucifixion, before he was ushered off and arrested by the Roman soldiers. Um, and it, the trees there are really, really magnificent. It's not, if you go there in person, it's not that big of an area. It's about 13,000 square feet. It's walled off at the base there. But what's unmistakably and undeniably just the, the mark of this area are the huge, giant olive trees that are spread throughout. And you can't help but notice them when you walk in. These are not likely the, the trees that were there when, when Jesus was walking the earth here. Um, but olive trees are said to live about 900 years long. They stand out 
And you really won't find many big trees in and around the area of Israel at all. Uh, they're, they're just glorified bushes, really, because of the temperature. There, you've got to go way north to Mount Hermon to see any trees with size on them. But when I look at these trees, I can't help but think about this whole biblical concept and idea of redemption. Um, I can't help but think about the work that God wants to do, not only in our church, but in my life personally. These trees are old. They're time-tested, weathered, ancient trees. They all have a story to tell. They've all been through a lot. They've gone through the experiences, the highs, the lows. They stood the test of time. They look like they've been through the gauntlet, and yet they remain standing. They're still there. Jerry Sitzer writes in his book, A Grace Revealed. I would highly recommend it to you. He says this. He says, he, speaking of God, wants to use the harsh conditions of life to shape us and eventually the whole world into something extraordinarily beautiful. Redemption, Sitzer writes, promises to transform us completely so. Once broken, we become whole again. Once selfish and insecure, we become stately and serene and self-giving. Once rabid sinners, we become glorious saints. He continues, he says, in short, God purposes to claim us as his own. No matter how far we are from him, how fallen into sin, how lost and lonely, he wants to restore us to a right relationship with him and to remake us according to the image of Jesus Christ. Redemption is a biblical concept that's very close, dear to my heart for several reasons. Uh, you'll learn more about this as we go, but the definition in, in hearing this word redemption might sound alien to you, might even sound somewhat intimidating on a, on a long list of the 10 cent theological words that can make you st sound really smart and impressive. You would probably find next to justification and atonement, this big word redemption. It has a deep and, and significant meaning to it. But nobody's ever going to ask you in your Christian life, how's your redemption going, Linda? Uh, nobody's going to talk to you about um, redemption in a, in a conversational manner for the most part. You're going to have to read it and study it in the pages of Scripture, systematic theology. Uh, if you use it in everyday language, you almost sound insufferably religious. Um, hardly seems relevant for our lives. Redemption is, a, is the major story of Scripture. The grand narrative that God has given us from Genesis 1 and 2 to Revelation 21 and 22 is one grand story of redemption through the Messiah, King Jesus, who has come not only to redeem us individuals, those he's, he has created, but to redeem the entire world and everything for his glory and for his purposes. Redemption is the key word, it's the theological center for my life, for scripture, for all of Christian theology. We will keep coming back to the idea of redemption and what it truly means to be set free into what God has originally and even better, what he will create us to be after he has done with us. When everything moves to a final and consummating redemption of all things. The greatest chapters in the Bible will emphasize redemption over and over again. The Romans 8, the Genesis 1 creation story. He creates, he redeems that which he creates. We will come again and again over and over to this idea of God's redemption and taking what was ruined by sin and making it beautiful and free for his purposes. Why do we want to study Exodus? <clears throat> we just finished our sermon series on Colossians. And when we did that, uh, we talked mostly about our identity in Christ. We talked about identity truth and identity transformation. Uh, the identity for Israel in the Old Testament will always take us back to Exodus and to their redemption from Egypt. If you were to ask a believer today, what central event is crucial for your faith, that without it, your faith basically falls apart? The answer would be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you were asked the same question to an Old Testament believer, the answer would be the redemption of Israel from Egypt. 
Uh, in fact, it is, it is um, in, inside of their greatest confessions of the faith, this idea that they were redeemed from Egypt. Deuteronomy 26, verses 5 through 9 says this, A wandering Aramean was my father. He went down into Egypt, and he sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. The Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice, saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. Verse 8, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. He brought us into this place to give us this land flowing with milk and honey. The Israelites would have known this. They would have memorized this extremely well. Next to Deuteronomy chapter 6, it is their confession of faith. It is their story. The redemption from Egypt is a central redemptive event through all of the Bible. Exodus is central to Israel's identity. It is central to helping us understand <clears throat> redemption through Jesus and what took place for us on the cross of Christ. And so we will consistently look back uh, to Jesus as the fulfillment of the Exodus. Structurally, when you look at the book of Exodus today, I just want to introduce this. A few points on some outlines. Uh, we'll begin to talk through chapter one just briefly, okay? Structurally, when you look at the book of Exodus, it can be broken off into three very clear ordered sections. And almost every commentator will bring this out. They divide the book geographically. So the first part of the book is Israel in Egypt under slavery. To get to Exodus chapter 12 is the Passover lamb passage into 13. You're getting close to the Red Sea crossing there. That is the journey of Israel from Egypt to Mount Sinai. I don't really know that they're going there, uh, but that's where the Lord takes them, brings them to. And then the end of the book will be Israel at Mount Sinai for the rest of the time. You get the Ten Commandments. You got the Golden Calf episode. You've got worship, orderly worship ordained for the people of Israel. A lot of foundational things that we will continue to come back to again as we go through this book. That outline right there focuses on the geography in Israel. What it lacks is the theology behind the book. It doesn't really tell you much about the message, what Exodus is trying to teach us. What it emphasizes in geography, it lacks in theology. So while the structure focuses on Israel physically, it really says nothing about Israel spiritually. So the way I want to preach through Exodus is to take more of a theological approach. We'll look at it in four sections as we preach through it, all centering on redemption, all centering on this experience for the Israelites. You're going to see the power of redemption. We're going to ask and answer this question in chapters one through five. What are we redeemed from? To be from what are we redeemed? If you don't want to end your sentences and prepositions, people. Uh, secondly, you're going to see patterns of redemption. How does God do it? Uh, you're going to see a lot of familiar patterns through Scripture. Deliverance from water, drawing out from the water. Uh, deliverance through sacrifice, blood sacrifice, and a lamb. You see a lot of patterns that are going to sound very familiar to us. You're going to see the process of redemption, number three. In what ways do we experience it? This is where we'll talk about the, uh, the Red Sea crossing, the journeying to Mount Sinai, very formative. This is where you see Israel kind of in their um, preteen stages. If you want to look at the life of Israel in that way, God brings them through the wilderness, this, these formative growth years to establish who he is, who they are, and why they need God so deeply. And then fourth, you're going to see the purpose of redemption. What are we redeemed for? Why? Why did God redeem us? He redeemed us for a purpose. It means that redemption is both an event and a process for Christians. We'll flesh that out as we go. Power, patterns, process, and purpose. As we go, I paid big money at Dallas Theological Seminary to begin all those words with P, okay? <laughs> Keep you guys on the edge of your seats. Exodus in the New Testament. There's a, there's a principle in the Bible. You're really going to see this a lot as we go through. The things in the Old Testament that are concealed are those that are revealed in the New Testament. Old te the Old Testament tells us about the Christ who will come, the New Testament tells us about the Christ who has come. 
Again, Exodus is foundational for understanding God's work of redemption through Christ as we look forward to it. God's redemption, redemption from slavery in Egypt is the high watermark for faith in Israel. It is the most spectacular, the most memorable, the quintessential event of redemption, which all other redemptive events will look back to Exodus, New Testament and Old Testament. This book establishes the fact that Exodus holds a revelational priority through Scripture. It is something true for all of us as well. Israel will learn about God as their Redeemer well before he learns about them as, their, as his Creator. Israel learns about God as Redeemer before they learn about God as Creator. It's something, again, that's also true for us. Calvin put it this way, while God is first the Creator and then the Redeemer, we must first know Him as Redeemer and then as Creator. You can't understand God as Creator until you trust and believe Him, until He redeems you from sin. The reason this is important is because redemption signifies an original state of affairs. There was a way that once was, a condition that used to prevail from the past. In redemption, you're, you're in a, a category of words that begins with, with re at the beginning, the prefix to redo, to restore, to rebuild, to redesign, to remodel. It tells you there was once a model there, and you're going back to that. God is moving back to something in his work of redemption. He's taking Israel back from bad to good. He's taking them back from crooked to straight, from slavery to freedom, from sickness to health. Israel has been held captive by a, a usurper. He's taken them back to their true king, their true creator God, who loved them and, to, and who redeemed them. And so we experience this as believers as well when we trust Christ. And, and again, redemption is the key central thought for this entire book. Let's look at chapter 1 and, and read some verses here. We're not going to be able to spend a ton of time on any of these. I apologize for that. So next week, we'll, we'll focus up a little bit more and, and look into the details of the text. Exodus, redemption in Exodus, it starts with the promises of God. Redemption starts with the promises of God. Look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Your text should say something like this. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, and Benjamin, verse 4, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then the text says, verse 6, that Joseph died and all his brothers in all that generation, but the people of Israel were fruitful. They increased greatly, they multiplied, they grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Exodus starts this way. These are the names. In Hebrew, here's how you say that. Ve'ele shemot. These are the names. And actually, if you look to the, the title of this book in Hebrew, the title is Shemot, names. It's not Exodus. Our English title, Exodus, comes from the Greek translation of a, to journey out is basically what that means. But the Hebrew name is different. These are the names of. And it's continuing a story out of Genesis. We'll talk about that just in a little bit. I want to establish a couple things right at the beginning of this, uh, of this chapter in this book. First, the author begins with a list of all the 12 tribes from the nation of Israel. And immediately it takes readers back to Genesis chapter 46, where all of those names are listed in the exact same order as Jacob is blessing the people of Israel and Joseph is in Egypt, Joseph is actually about to die. All right. Second, the author tells us more information about Joseph than any of the other sons of Israel. The last verses in Genesis chapter 50 were designated to describe the death of Joseph and how he died in Egypt and what his requests were for his bones. This seems very obvious. This is an important point for the text. And when you look at big picture, take a step back, look at the first five books of the Bible, it's extremely important. Exodus is continuing the story that started in Genesis. 
Exodus is a specific story to Israel, the beginning of their redemptive story. And it's tightly connected to what precedes it and also what follows after it. The reason this is so important is because of what Exodus chapter 1, verse 6 says. Look down at your text. Verse 6, then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation, period, full stop, end of the paragraph, new thought starts in verse 7, right? What would your average Joe Israelite be thinking if he just, Hezekiah Israelite reads this, end of verse 6, Joseph died, all his brothers, and all that generation. What would they be thinking at that point in the story? Abraham is given the promises of God, land, seed, blessing. He dies. Doesn't get to see any of those promises really fulfilled. Isaac gets the promises of God, land, seed, blessing. He dies. So they have heir, heir to the promise. That's about it. Jacob dies, doesn't see the land of blessing, never comes and Israel never becomes a nation. Now Joseph, one of the, the brothers that inherited these promises from the Old Testament, now he dies. All his generation with him dies. What's going to happen? Where are the promises of God? Will God fulfill the things that he promised to the ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, over and over again? Where are we? What's going to happen to the people of Israel? What's going to happen to God and to this story? And then we read verse 7, it picks up. But the people of Israel were fruitful, they increased greatly, they multiplied, and they grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. And that sounds exactly like one of the verses that occurs right at the beginning of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 28 says this, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. The same verbs are used in almost the exact same order. Everybody reading this passage in, Gen in Exodus is going to think about Genesis chapter 1. There's one big difference between those verses. In the creational mandate, be fruitful and multiply, were given as commands. In Exodus chapter 1, they are given as statements. It's what actually happened. They are indicatives. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all were given the promises, yet all of them died. Joseph died. What is your average Israelite thinking when they come to this text? When you study the Old Testament, a lot of ink has really been wasted on this because of uh, modern man and the things that uh, we have to know for ourselves and our theories and conjectures. You probably, if you study Old Testament much, you might have heard something called the documentary hypothesis. People look back at the Old Testament text and they say, this portion of the text is, is from this era, from this time, and so we're going to give this a J source. We're going to give this an Elohim source. We're going to give this a priestly source. It sounds like something that comes from the ceremonial laws and all the ways that they just divide the text out. What you need to know is that, A, we don't believe in that, number one. We believe in the first five books of the Bible are a unit, a unity, and Moses wrote all of them. We believe that because that's what Jesus said in the New Testament. It's pretty clear. They were likely written, all of these books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, were likely written in a unified form, and they were likely written to the generation that was either wandering through the wilderness and about to enter the land with Joshua, or the generation that did enter the land of promise with Joshua. One of those two options is what you have. And Hebrews 11 verse 13 says something very interesting. It says this. It talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It says, all these men died in the faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. What are we thinking about the promises of God? One man has put it this way. One of the great enemies of hope is forgetting God's promises. One of the great enemies of hope is forgetting God's promises. There's a famous quote that says this, the Lord may delay his promises, but he will never deny them. The Lord may delay his promises, but he will never deny them. And so Exodus 1, when it picks up with Israel and slavery in Egypt, there's a reminder, a great reminder. 
of the promises of God, the creational blessing that was given to them. And despite the situation that they're in, God's promises still remain. They're still for the people of God. And he's going to sustain this people in a way that, um, in a way that's new and different than what they experienced and, and went through in the past. You guys have heard me say this before. It's, it's just such a key theme through all of the Pentateuch. What God has done in the past is a model and a promise of what he will do in the future, though he is too creative to do the same thing in the same way twice. And if you ask any Christian couple in here that's over the age of 50, they are giving hearty amens to those statements. What God has done in the past is a model and a promise of what he will do in the future, though he is too creative to do the same thing in the same way twice. And redemption is one of those things that he will do again and again for us. Look down at at Exodus uh, verse 8 here, chapter 1. Number two in your outline, redemption is not unrestrained freedom, but it's serving the right master. Look down at Exodus 1 verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Knowledge is power. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. This is something to consider. A new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities of Pithom and Raamses. Notice the two A's there. They'll be different later on in the book. Verse 12, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. And so they ruthlessly made, and and here's the two verses that you really need to uh, focus in on, 13 and 14. They ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, made, made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And it should be further explained in the text. A king did not know the blessing that Joseph brought to the Egyptian people and to the nation. Remember, Joseph was the son of Jacob, sold by his brothers into slavery. During the famine that came into the land, it was Joseph who had the wherewithal to interpret Pharaoh's dream build up some of these store cities, store the grain so they could survive the famine. This new, new king did not see Israel as a source of blessing that Joseph had brought to that people. Instead, he saw them as a threat. He chose fear over faith, and he went with the wisdom of the world instead of the wisdom of God and God's ways. The irony is in verse 10. Notice what they say. Perhaps they will War will break out, and they will join with our enemies. War is going to break out on Pharaoh, but they're not going to join with any enemies. They're going to defeat him in battle at the Red Sea, and they don't need another nation. They don't need another people group to do it. The end of this paragraph is written, though, so readers can really identify with the feeling, the tone of this passage. What we're supposed to do is read verses 13 and 14 and feel the severity of the labor that the Israelites were experiencing. The first description in verse 13 is that their work was ruthless. And you're going to see that adjective uh, used again in verse 14. After the work being described as ruthless, there's four other descriptions of how intolerable and extreme their slave labor was in Egypt. You've got bitter lives, hard service, all kinds of work. And this is a key theme, this is a key word, not only in Exodus chapter 1, but throughout the beginning of the book. The Hebrew word for work is avad, and it's a, again, it's a very highly, it's a deep, highly nuanced word when you read it in the Old Testament. It has many meanings. It's really hard because, again, there's three basic meanings to that word for work, okay? What Israel needed here as they were um, serviced and as they were put into this harsh labor was not necessarily freedom from the bondage of Israel, but freedom to serve the right master. But 
when you read this word work, there's three different categories for how you'll see that. You, it either means work, serve, and labor hard. This is Genesis 2 kind of stuff. There was thorns and thistles, and so Adam and Eve had to work the ground after the curse, Genesis 3. You're serving and you're laboring in the garden. Number two, work means to perform, do, or make. And then thirdly, work means to worship, to live for, to surrender to even. And so the same word that's used for work here that describes Pharaoh will be used for what the Israelites will do with God at the base of Mount Sinai when they come to worship, to serve, and to work for him. It's not only a, a graphic portrayal of their hard labor, but it's also a setup. It's a foreshadowing of something that's to come in the story. What Israel needed, again, was not independence from Pharaoh and Egypt per se, but an exchange of dependency, an exchange of trust, an exchange of loyalty, an exchange of their true and underlying master over all things. The same word will use be of Pharaoh and God. One commentator put it this way, they didn't need to get out from an oppressive leader as much as they needed to get under a benevolent one. Israel didn't need to get out from an oppressive leader as much as they needed to get under a benevolent one. Israel was forced to serve and labor as slaves to Pharaoh. They will be free to serve and labor for their Lord God and King, who is the one true God of heaven and earth. Redemption is freedom, but freedom is never unrestrained in unlimited freedom. It's always choosing the right master who we are to serve. We limit our freedoms based on who we are ultimately serving. Number three, in your outline really quickly, again, I wish I could spend more time on this. Living redemptive lives is never easy, but it is always memorable. Living redemptive lives is never easy, but it, it is always memorable. And this is probably my favorite part of chapter one because of the ladies that are mentioned, okay? Look down at verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. Now, if you highlight or underline in your Bible, highlight verse 15 in there. We're going to come back to it. So when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they are vigorous. You know where that word vigorous was used earlier in Exodus chapter 1? ruthlessly served, back in verse 13 and 14. Ruthless and vigorous are the same Hebrew word. Why are the Hebrew women so vigorous? Because you put them into slave labor camps, Pharaoh. This is, this is your doing. You want to know why they're so strong and able to give birth before anybody comes to them? Because you set this whole thing up. This is what you did, and you're going to see a lot of things come back on Pharaoh now as this account uh, wraps up in chapter 1. Midwife said to Pharaoh, because, verse 19, the women are not like the Egyptian women, they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And Pharaoh commanded all of his people, saying, every son who is to be born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. I wish I could go into more detail again here, but I want to just tell you a, a quick movie reference. Have you guys seen Troy? Have I shared this with you before? You know the, the story, uh, you know Brad, Brad Pitt movie? No? Don't know him? It's okay. You don't need to. Uh, Troy, was, Troy was a great movie. It came out not too long ago. It's a, the movie about Achilles, the great Greek warrior. And there's a scene at the very beginning of this. Uh, the king of Thessaly, Thessalonica, comes out to battle Agamemnon and all of his forces. And Agamemnon has a much bigger army, is much stronger. He's just ruthlessly taking over Greece and all, all areas along with it. And he's got this special warrior. And so, so Agamemnon and the king of Thessaly come together, together at the beginning of this movie, and they say, listen, 
So much blood has already been spilt. Let's not shed any more blood today of our armies. Instead, King of Thessaly, I want you to take your greatest warrior and bring him out. I'll take my greatest warrior, Agamemnon, and I'll bring him out, and we'll fight. And whoever wins the battle, that army is going to win this day instead of having all this bloodshed. And so this, this gigantic man comes out. He's just like a Goliath structure. Uh, this guy looks impenetrable, the nastiest looking warrior. This guy was like bred to fight. And then Agamemnon calls for Achilles, and he wasn't even in the battle to begin with. Uh, Aaron boy has to run back to the camp, back to his tent, and get him. And this little boy finally finds Achilles in his tent, and he says to him, you need to come out for the battle. You're being called up for one single solitary fight. And he, and he says to him, he says, the Thessalonian you are fighting, he's the biggest man that I've ever seen. I wouldn't want to fight him if I were you. And Achilles responds back just one little quick statement. He says, that is why nobody will remember your name. And he goes out, and he puts a verwheel slash on this guy. <laughs> just, just kidding, kidding. You guys know I star in all those movies, just in case you're wondering. In Hebrew, focus with me, please. Jeremiah, I saw you dozing off over there. Don't worry. I'm just totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. In Hebrew narrative, pay attention, pay attention to how people are named in narrative. This is a really important part of hermeneutics when you read narrative in your Bible. Uh, stories like Ruth, Genesis, Exodus are narrative. Pay attention to how people are named. The titles that are used, the places that they come from, and how that shifts around from time to time. Verse 15 is written the longest way you could possibly write verse 15. There were a thousand different ways that verse 15 could have been written. There were two Hebrew midwives. That's all you had to say. You didn't have to mention their names at all. There were two Hebrew midwives that were helping the Hebrew ladies have these babies. There were two Hebrew midwives. They were serving the Lord and doing these things. Any, any which way. The narrator, the writer here, presumably Moses, goes to great extent, great lengths. He draws this out as long as he possibly can. And he says... The Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, if you read this in Hebrew, the other of whom was named Pua. He just expands it, and all of our attention is, is drawn to these two women. What do their names mean? Why is this significant in the passage? I find it very, very interesting in the story of Exodus that these two women specifically are named. And names are extremely important throughout Exodus. In Exodus chapter 2, we're going we're gonna to get to a really important name, Moses. You will call him Moses because he was drawn out from the water. In chapter 3, you're going to get even a more important name in chapter 3. Who shall I say sent me to them? I am who I am sent you. You get the personal name of the Lord, the relational covenant name of God, Yahweh, in Exodus chapter 3. We've already seen a list of 12 names in Exodus chapter 1. The book is called, These Are the Names Of. You know who's not named in the book of Exodus? There's one, one specific person. We know his title. We don't know who he is. Pharaoh is never, ever named. You know him by title more than you know what his personal name actually was. Why? Why is Pharaoh not named, but these two women are? Because what Pharaoh did, did is not worth remembering. But what these two women did is. These two, most, most people believe if you were a midwife in Israel, serving as a midwife at this time, you yourself were unable to have kids. And so they selected you purposely so you could have the experience, you could still be involved in families with this people group. So these insignificant, unappreciated, unknown, marginalized women, two of them, are specifically named and two of them are specifically remembered. For what they did. As we, as we close this morning, 
I want to just talk about, really b- briefly, about um, the significant things in life, the things worth naming. Biblically, redemption is often sourced in the insignificant and the marginalized. Redemption, biblically, is often sourced in the insignificant and the marginalized. In John chapter 1, there's a, there's a really good account of the gospel and the news of Jesus that is spreading from disciple to disciple to disciple. And there's one guy, Philip, who becomes a believer. He hears about Jesus. He meets him and immediately becomes a follower. And Philip wants to do what every brother would want to do. He wants to go tell his brother, Nathaniel, about Jesus. He wants to tell him to come and see this person, Jesus. Right? And so Philip says to them, Come, I have seen and I have met Jesus of Nazareth. Follow him with me. And Nathaniel gives him a, a quick response, and he says this, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Are we talking about somebody from an insignificant, poor, rural town on the outskirts of Israel? And so Philip says to them, Come and see. Redemption is often sourced in the insignificant and the marginalized in Scripture. Jesus came from an insignificant, poor family. He came from a marginalized context at that time in a region of the world that was dominated by Rome. How could anything significant, how could anything redemptive come out of Nazareth? How could anything good come from these two Hebrew insignificant women? They're going to preserve lives. They're going to preserve the mediator and the liberator of Israel. And they're going to make sure that he lives through this thing. And God ordained it and providentially brought about the result that he brought about. All of this is setting us up for Exodus chapter 2, when Moses will come on the scene as one of these boys who they let uh, go floating down the Nile. It's just a really great uh, aspect of, of God working despite the challenges and the opposition against his redemptive purposes. Number two, be careful of choosing fear over faith. Be careful of choosing fear over faith. Pharaoh and Egypt are so afraid that they were commanded to kill all the males in Egypt. Before Israel leaves Egypt, it'll be Egypt's firstborn males that are going to die. Did you notice that? We're going we're to start turning the tables. You're going to see a beautiful irony, if I can picture it with that kind of phrase on Egypt and their initiatives. Pharaoh was angry at the midwife women for killing the males, but it will be Pharaoh's daughter, a woman, who saves Moses from the Nile River and brings about and allows the mediator and the liberator to live. Pharaoh's command was to drown all the babies in the Nile. Guess who gets drowned in the Red Sea before too long? Pharaoh and all of his army. All these initiatives, all these tactics he's taken. Exodus 1 depicts a delicious irony. Just about all of his plans to thwart Israel's purposes, redemption, significance, will be flipped back on himself because he chose fear over faith. Because he forgot Joseph, the one who brought blessing to the nation of Israel. He chose his own wisdom rather than believing and choosing God's wisdom and God's ways. Exodus chapter 1 sets us up for a redemptive story. It sets us up for the miraculous birth of of Moses and the preservation of his life as he begins to work and, and to deliver and to redeem Israel out of Egypt through the mighty works of God. But all of it, all of it points to the greatest redemptive story ever told because there was a curse that was given to man. That if you sin against God, if you disobey him, the punishment for sinning, the punishment for the violation of the covenant was death. You should experience nothing. You should expect nothing but death. And what God did in his redemptive plan is he even used that curse, the curse of death, became a blessing and he flipped everything 180 degrees around to give a redemptive purpose to what Satan, the best that Satan could do, to bring about his purposes. God redeemed it and used it. So even in the death of our Lord and Savior, we experience the redemption of life and true freedom from sin. Um, The story of of Exodus 
is going to set us some patterns to see the, the crucifixion and the death of Jesus in lights and in ways that are memorable, are patterns that are unforgettable. And so I want you to take some time and, and read through the book as you uh, have some time in your quiet times as you go. All right, let's pray. And then uh, Hale is coming up for a quick, quick announcement for family life. Father in heaven, thank you again for uh, your word. Um, I thank you that you've preserved the memory and the names of those who are significant enough to be remembered in the Bible. I thank you for uh, these two women. Thank you for Pharaoh's daughter um, and working your grace and your purposes through her to preserve the life of Moses. Um, we thank you for the way that you, you take the insignificant the marginalized, the otherwise unimportant, and you use them for great purposes and plans that are beyond anything that we could ever ask or imagine. Uh, I thank you that their legacy was preserved for the faith that they had in the midst of uh, a difficult context and difficult circumstance. I pray that you would give us each uh, the power to do what is memorable. Help us to be redemptive agents for the purpose of your gospel to bring the truth of the gospel to a world who desperately needs it. And the best that Satan can do against us, Lord, we pray that you would uh, use those things for your purposes and take ashes and make them beautiful. Uh, take the curse of death and make it a blessing because of Jesus and what he's done for us. Give us a hope and a significance, um, not only through reading this book for ourselves, but also by just understanding what happened in the past as a model and a promise for us in the future to trust you more every single day. We ask this to you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit, for you three are the one true God, and there is no God besides you. Amen. Amen.